Harrison Armory is the youngest core prostate among the big three at only approximately 500 years old. Yet, unlike interplanetary shipping Northstar that forever pursues profit, and Smith Shimano Core Pro that constantly perfects the human body, Harrison Armory is probably the only company closest to being a true core prostate in every sense of the word, for better or worse. Next to GMS, the Armory is the second most popular arms supplier for both militaries and police forces for both the Diasporans and Cosmopolitans. Their flagship mech, the Sherman, is in fact the second most common chassis in the entire known region, after only the famous Everest chassis. This would not have been possible without the home world of the Armory, Ras Shamra, a former GMS project world made to house a massive research industrial arcology that literally surrounded the planet on the habitable band of the tidal locked planet. Also this is gonna be the only artwork of Ras Shamra available right now so until anyone else manages to draw a better art this is basically how Ras Shamra will look like for the rest of eternity. This also wouldn't be possible without Sep Kli, Special Exception Persistent Cultivation Legion Space Engine, also known, as the Think Tank. The Think Tank is essentially a copy of Galsim, but rather than housing sovereign class bicameral minds that literally can't think for themselves, the Think Tank housed many, many, near cascade and unshackled NHP to both design and dream of new paracasual technology for the armory to develop. The only reason why this was even allowed is because the Union is in on the research too, a part of the war treaty signed after the interest war so Union could both check on the technologies developed by the armory, and to ensure the armory doesn't try to fuck things up again. Let's just say the armory tried to use the think tank for immortality and that has dragged some, unwanted attentions. There is however, another reason why Union kept such a close eye on Harrison Armory. Five centuries ago, SECOM collapsed after its people was enraged by the genocide they committed during the Hercinia crisis. Many members of the anthro-chauvinist party fled and escaped to the far region of space, one such party officer named John Creighton Harrison founded the company from a coalition of mining communes present on Ras Shamra. A whole bunch of things happened while the third committee lifted itself up, and now the Union and Harrison Armory has a trade agreement to supply the Union fleet and military. That by no means they are allies at all, just merely benefiting from each other, for now. Since its foundation, Harrison Armory is, and still, ruled by the clone heirs of their founder, now in its third iteration as John Creighton Cruz Harrison III after John Creighton Harrison II experienced what a full long spool barge from the entire Armory fleet tasted like. That is not to say they are the same person however, merely sharing the gene of the original John Creighton Harrison, but it does show how obsessed the armory is with the image of their dead founder. Besides a wide catalogs of warships, chassis, and weapons expected for a galactic arms dealer, Harrison Armory is also known for sturdy exploration gears, logistics and infrastructure packages of all levels, personal vehicles, and fine liquors, all of which I can see being consumed by the armory itself in copious amount, especially the last one for those that are too damn sober. They are also responsible for their distal development program, which rapidly boosts galactic economic trade for diasporan worlds by cultivating and exporting exotic xeno spices, flora, fauna, and minerals for consumer use. For most people in the core worlds and well-developed diasporan worlds, they would know Harrison Armory as a weapons manufacturer and defense contractor that would get mentioned in the various newscasts on cradle politics, colonial affairs, or IPS and stranglehold on interstellar shipping. Those that studied the history of Cradle and Union might know what Harrison Armory originated from, but to someone who wasn't a cosmopolitan, 500 years would make anything looks like old news. But, that's enough corporate stuff for now, I think it's time to explain the state part of the core pro state the Armory is. Besides being the second most popular arms seller in the known space, Harrison Armory is an imperialistic expansionist state that works to develop and expand human presence across the star, mirroring the goal of Union, except they kept suffering a hiccup called not preserving human rights. Besides Ras Shamra, the armory has the purview, an entire region of worlds taken by the Harrison armory during the interest war against the Karakan trade baronies, providing resources and manpower the armory seek to fuel the forges of Ras Shamra. And even now, the purview kept expanding. More and more diasporan worlds joined the armory, as the armory maintained a portfolio of successful colonization and development, with promises of meritocratic citizenship, infrastructure development, and protection. Most joined willingly, some didn't and was then further, persuaded, by the colonial legions of the armory, which often caused the Union's Department of Justice and Human Right to start knocking on their front door, and if that fails, fucking break it down. It was quite clear that this method didn't always work for the armory as even in their latest regional expansion, the Dawnline Shore, 
the armory is going to suffer some major issues if they kept brute forcing their expansion. Speaking of the Colonial Legion, the Harrison Armory's Colonial Legionate is a part of the Imperial Forces of the Corps Pro State, which falls under the direct command of John Creighton Cruz Harrison III, Director General of Harrison Armory. The Colonial Legionate commands hundreds of Colonial Legions, each containing a division strength advance team of Legionnaires and Colonial Officers called, an Acquisition and Management Team, or AMT. The role of the AMT is rather complicated, when a world is designated as colonial priority, an AMT will make a beachhead on the world to integrate with and police the local population while the annexation negotiation undergoes, which can take quite a long while. This has two functions, first is for the presence of the armory to be familiarized by the people of the world, and by integrating with the population, the AMT could fully understand the local culture of the world, which could aid in the negotiation. Second, is if the talk breaks down and the resistance begins, the AMT could identify target priorities on anti-armory leaders and establish a green zone with armory sympathetic population, forming a local auxiliary forces while waiting for the rest of the colonial legion to arrive. And when they arrive, the world's flag will inevitably turn into the armory's purple, the bruise, as it is called by union auxiliaries forced into peacekeeping roles on armory worlds. When an announcement is made for a new colonial mission, both colonial subjects and citizens of all classes within Armory's purview are encouraged to enlist into the Colonial Legion. For the non-citizens, serving in the Legion would grant them and their family citizenship. For the citizens, they are promised promotion, social standing, credit increases, debt forgiveness, and favorable compensation for their family with their commitment. Enlistment into the Colonial Legion was in fact a popular way for adult Armory citizens to further promote their ranking. Management rank citizens instead could not just join the Colonial Legion too, but also have the option of purchasing officer commissions, which is rather limited in number and as such, the bidding for the position could be rather fierce. For everyone within the armory, a career within the Colonial Legions is seen as an adventure to both raise their status and finance. Most deployments after all, only lasted two real-time years or so, but whether the actual harsh realities of the deployment matched with what was shown on armory's propaganda was another thing entirely. At present, Harrison Armory works closely with Union Administrative Department to properly integrate worlds targeted for requisition as a part of the Union. But while executive branch of both sides are cooperative, things are different on the ground. Union administrators assigned to these worlds often seek to protect as much of it as possible from the Armory's aggressive imperialism. As an Union administrator's role is to integrate a world into the Union, and may only ever live and work on a single world in their entire lifespan, being handed a world conquered, possibly violently, by the armory might significantly quicken their post-mortem retirement. For the armory's liberation and world building's missions, the colonial legions are deployed en masse to topple the local tyrant. While the colonial legions are welcomed as liberators at first, as they have beaten the previous oppressors, friction might occur as some people realize that they have merely switched out who their head bowed to after the dust has settled and rebuilding began. To the armory, this was merely the price the world paid for liberation, to be integrated into the purview, adopting Armory's culture, and showing their commitment to the state. So, strength, durability, power. For many people, the phrase made in Ras Shamra is a sign of quality, and it's true. Harrison Armory makes the best of the best, equipping their war machine with the most advanced technology available to humanity, ensuring dominance over others with overwhelming power boiling beneath the brutal, geometric aesthetic of their chassis. Just be aware that those that pursue power, might demand you to call them master. Hello there, if you like this video, please subscribe to my channel and click that notification bell button. If you really want to support my channel, you could visit my Patreon page, or buy me some Kofi, links in the description. Anyway, have a nice day.